Coming up on episode four of Omnivore, product innovation in sandwiches, an assessment of chemicals in food packaging, and clean label ingredients for plant-based meat alternatives. All that and more, this is Omnivore from the editors of Food Technology and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by IFT's 2022 Compensation and Career Path Report. Get the latest information on the science of food salaries, benefits, career paths, and more. Download a copy at ift.org slash salary survey. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology Magazine, where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. From the ubiquitous fried chicken sandwich to the extravagant croque madame, Sandwiches and other handheld foods are having one of those moments. Truth be told, sandwiches have always been the workhorses of restaurant and food service menus. But with inflation driving food costs higher than ever, sandwiches are stealing the spotlight. Food Technologies' Kelly Hensel recently chatted with consultant Maeve Webster about all things sandwiches and why they're getting so much love both from consumers and food service operators. So what is it about sandwiches that make them a smart option for food service operators? So I I think there are a lot of benefits to sandwiches. Sandwiches are, from a back of house point of view, given all of the labor issues that operators are facing, sandwiches tend to be a very easy product for almost anyone to pull together. They don't take a lot of training. They don't take a lot of time. I mean, you obviously want to, you know, be careful and mindful about what you're designing, but they are a little bit foolproof compared to other items that might be on the menus. They, they are infinitely customizable and, and appropriate for virtually every single type of operation. Uh, from a front of house point of view, from the consumer point of view, because they are constantly changing and evolving and, and there's never ever just one type of sandwich, even if you take uh, something ubiquitous like the club sandwich, there are so many iterations of what that can be and how that can be dressed up and made appropriate for any type of operation, regardless of the cuisine focus or whatnot, that consumers can never get tired of them. A- and so they are they are constantly relevant. They are portable. They are generally affordable compared to other items. So th- there really is almost n- no downside to the sandwich category, which is a really nice thing given everything else going on in the industry. Yeah, that's a it's a really good point, especially given you know current inflation and cost of food. I assume that consumers are being obviously very judicious about where they want to spend their money when they eat out. And like you've mentioned, um, sandwiches are by their nature a little bit more affordable than say obviously a steak or lobster. But what can food service operators do with their sandwich creations to entice consumers even more? Well, I think in general, food service operators need to think about the value proposition that they are providing their customers. And that can be, I mean, that's a a really large continuum, right? So depending on the operation and and the consumers that they're drawing in and targeting, on one hand, the value proposition might be volume and the size of of the sandwich and, and the satiety essentially that you're getting um, from that sandwich. On the opposite end of the spectrum, that value proposition can be quality and premium ingredients. And so volume isn't necessarily where you're going with that, but uh, everything in it is going to be really great quality, really well designed, really well pulled together. And then in between that is all different levels of uh, innovativeness or comfort or uh, familiarity, you, you know, and so there are so many different ways that I think operators can position their sandwiches. And then with next year, who knows where inflation or recession is going to end up being. If they are being more judicious with their spending overall, sandwiches can be that food transportation experience where rather than traveling, rather than going places, rather than experiencing things beyond the bounds of your world, sandwiches can provide that kind of transportation and experimentation and and exploration. Yeah, that's a really great point. I, I know I've tried a lot of different kinds of cuisines through sandwiches or handheld items. Um, just, you know, it's a feel safer 
somehow. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and they, and really virtually every single cuisine in this or you know, culture in this world has some kind of a sandwich type yeah. item, right? So they work for everyone. There's an iteration of them that is appropriate for all cu cultures yeah. um, and makes, make, it just makes them so approachable and so comfortable. In the article, there's some stats by from Data Essential, and apparently mm -hmm. the term fried is now found on 37.1% of sandwich menus, and it, that's up 10% in the past four years. Mm -hmm. And I was curious as, as to how that aligns with consumers' desire for healthier options. So... I, I'm not familiar with what all is in that stat. My guess is a lot of what's driving that are the fried chicken sandwiches. So th they, you know, obviously they're a behemoth trend in and of themselves. And I think they have definitely driven a lot of that uh, because all these operators are just throwing fried chicken sandwiches on the menu, no matter what. But of course you've got other, the katsu sando was really big right before the pandemic. That obviously is fried to some degree. And then you've got fried seafood and all this. So I think that, I think, in some cases, it's not going to align, right? The, fr the fried sandwiches are all about indulgence and really throwing caution to the wind and just enjoying something for the sake of what it is. Um, but I think there are fried sandwiches that can still align, and particularly with younger consumers who don't feel like it has to be all healthy, all in, all the time to still feel good about what you're eating. There's definitely far more of an interplay between the indulgence and the health and how that can work. So if you've got very lightly breaded, like the sand, the katsu sandos, which are not the heavy breading, if you've got seafood rather than something else, then that can lend itself to a somewhat healthier fried experience. And then of course there are going to be fried vegetable sandwiches, right? Because we're still in the midst of, and I think this is a fundamental change, the plant forward movement, so that also facilitates that. But again, because sandwiches are something you can eat, you know, arguably every single day of your life, right? Without, without being problematic, that you can indulge one day. And then there are plenty of incredibly healthful sandwich options, whether they are in wraps or just the ingredients are more healthy and the, you know, the spreads are healthier, that, that you can really dip your toe into the indulgence, the healthy and anything in between throughout the course of a week, a month, you know, and, and have no problem with that. So what are you seeing? What are some new exciting sandwiches, handheld menu, menu items that you've seen recently? So I think that what we're seeing now, and this is a return from what was happening before the pandemic and then kind of, kind of got put on pause while we were in the midst of all that, is a lot of the international influences. So I think you are beginning to see more and a broader range of international influences. I was just looking at a sandwich that was very heavily influenced by South American flavors and cultures, and the carrier was plantain, a uh, kind of plantain fritters, um, and then everything in it was pulled from a different uh, range of cuisines from Central and South America. So that was really interesting. Um, I've seen sandwiches now that are pulling from Asian cuisines and but then merging them with whether it's a European bent or an American bent. Um, I was just reading a little while ago an article from Eater that talked about chaos cooking. And I, I'm not sure if that's the right term to use, but it's kind of the next iteration of mashups and fusion where it's really not bound by this authenticity discussion that we've been having over the last couple of years. And it's really chefs saying, look, here's my background. I've traveled here. I grew up here. My ancestors are from here. And all of that is contributing to my interpretation of whatever it is I'm making at the time. And I think that's what we're seeing with sandwiches now, um, spice blends, uh, different sauces and condiments, uh, whether or not there's cheese, you know, may or may not be relevant based on the cuisine type. So I do think that that international element that's just beginning to blow up even things like club sandwiches and fried chicken sandwiches and make them so much more complex and and interesting uh, and not what you are expecting uh, every time you pick one of those up. Well, that's really exciting. And I, I can't wait to try some of those out on the menus around me. So thank you so much, Maeve, for the time. Sure. It's been a pleasure and I'm now really hungry. So, <laughs> Maeve Webster is president of Menu Matters, a consultant and trend watcher in the food industry for nearly 20 years. You can discover more about sandwiches and handhelds, including how plant-based sandwiches are faring, in the December-January issue of Food Technology. 
Since 1990, more than 90% of all foodborne listeria cases in the United States were linked to deli meats, followed by ready-to-eat salads, according to a recently published study from the University of Minnesota. The research used a quantitative risk assessment model to analyze the prevalence of Listeria monocytogenes in various foods. This pathogenic bacterium can cause invasive listeriosis. While invasive listeriosis is rare, it can be fatal, especially for those who are at increased risk, including the elderly, pregnant women, newborns, and those with underlying health conditions. In this episode's news update, Associate Editor Emily Little highlights key findings from the study. I'm Emily Little, Associate Editor with Food Technology, and here's a story that I want to tell you about. There was a recent study published in the International Journal of Food Microbiology that linked the prevalence of listeriosis cases in the United States to various food categories. What did it say? That over 90% of all cases of listeriosis in the U.S., between 1990 and 2020 were linked to deli meats. Now this research comes from the University of Minnesota and it used a quantitative risk assessment model to analyze the prevalence of Listeria monocytogenes in various foods. This is the pathogenic bacterium that we know can cause invasive listeriosis. Now, while this foodborne illness is incredibly rare, it can be fatal to those at increased risk. Who's at increased risk, you might ask? The elderly, pregnant women, newborns, and those who already have underlying health conditions. According to this study, people within these at-risk populations face a 10 to 10,000 times higher possibility of infection than the general population. So it's really important that we mitigate these risks as much as possible to make sure that these susceptible people don't get sick. Now, in order to figure this out, these researchers took a lot of data. They've analyzed over half a million samples from various studies to estimate the prevalence of Listeria monocytogenes in retail food products. And about 63% of these samples were from the United States. The bacteria itself was most prevalent in deli meats, both in the U.S. and worldwide. This was followed by soft and semi-soft cheeses and ready-to-eat salads. When we go over to listeriosis, the illness, the results were about the same. Deli meats accounted for the most cases, followed by ready-to-eat salads, ready-to-eat seafood, soft and semi-soft cheeses, and frozen vegetables. Using this data and this research, the research team hopes that food manufacturers can use this information to begin to mitigate the risk of listeria monocytogenes contamination, including lot-by-lot testing of products that are most susceptible. And if we start taking these risks at the beginning of the processing cycle, we're more likely to catch it and prevent people from getting sick. That's all for me this week. I'll talk to you next time. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment. But first, this word from our sponsor. Over 3,000 respondents in two recent IFT surveys offered a ton of insights into salary and career satisfaction. When you download and read IFT's 2022 Compensation and Career Path Report, you'll learn about which regions of the U.S. pay the most, the top five most common job pain points, if the food profession is becoming more diverse, and what jobs make the most money. Get your copy and use it to negotiate your next raise. Go to ift.org slash salary survey. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. Although upwards of a thousand chemicals are approved for direct food contact packaging worldwide, research shows that a large percentage are linked to a range of health and environmental issues. Only 40% of approved food contact chemicals have had rigorous food safety assessments, highlighting the need to fill data gaps and improve the science around so-called chemicals of concern in food packaging. Our science and technology editor, Julie Larson Brisher, recently talked with Maricel Maffini, the internationally recognized scientist who successfully persuaded FDA to eliminate unsafe uses of chemicals in food, about avenues to address these chemicals of concern. 
Well, hi, Maricel. I'm really glad we could chat today about this important topic to the food industry, which is chemicals of concern in food packaging. So when you were talking with our contributing editor, Claire Sand, you talked about three aspects of chemicals of concern that should get increased focus by food packaging researchers. And I think those three, correct me if I'm wrong, were transparency, collaboration, and testing. How do, you, how do you think that these can help us solve challenges associated with COCs? Well, thank you, Julie, for having me, and I appreciate your question. Yeah, it is, it is an industry that has so many innovations that it tends to be a little less transparent than other industries because of their um, profitability and, and development and research and all those things. But I think the issue with transparency is most times we don't really know what is in a packaging itself. Not necessarily, we may know which are the, the initial ingredients. Think about a cake. The initial ingredients that you use to make a material, but those that you, the ingredients with which you start, maybe a number, then they are processed, other things are generated, other different components, and the final product may be slightly different. And you may have in the process generated other chemicals, um, byproducts. So we don't have, in many cases, a good understanding of the final product. We know which are the initial ingredients, but like when you make a cake, at the end, you see a cake. You don't see the eggs, the milk, the butter. So it is hard to figure out what is coming out, the potential migration and movement of some of those ingredients or new chemicals that were generated during the process of making a packaging material or, or even a manufacturing equipment that would also could generate this uh, byproduct uh, chemicals that then get into food. Think about a conveyor belt. So it is, it is important that we have a better understanding of which are the chemicals that may come out from the final product. Because as I said, may not be the same as the initial uh, ingredients. And the initial ingredients may have been nasty, to say a word that is not very popular probably, but, but they are disappearing at the end because they are consumed, they are reacting quickly and easily, and they produce another product that may be less complex and less problematic. The other way could also happen. You start with benign materials, and at the end, you produce something that could potentially be more problematic. So I think it is important to have as much information as we can and be as transparent as we can to eliminate those secondary problems that could, or secondary chemicals that could be generated when the, the packaging is is uh, formed, put together, glued, etc. Because packaging is a complex issue. It's a complex product. Some of them are, you don't see it, them, but they're multi layers that are put together with adhesives and things like that. So we appreciate the packaging because it reduces food waste. But we also need to keep in mind that the packaging could be a source of chemicals that get into the food and into the people that could eventually create problems. So what about collaboration? Collaboration would be ideal. The issue is that in many cases, there are some research and development that was put forth by companies that are not necessarily willing to share which uh, what is in their secret sauce to make a good packaging. Uh, and, and I appreciate that, um, they make investments, but it is important that if we want to figure out whether the packaging is safe, whether there is something that comes out 
from a packaging that has lots of layers to protect the food that is at the end. And through those layers, there are adhesives, there are other components that may eventually migrate into the food and could potentially have a health uh, concern for the, the individual, the consumer. I think we need to create a system where those processes are shared not only with regulators, but also on our present in databases that people could access and have a better understanding of what goes into the complexity of a packaging or the complexity of a processing equipment. This is not supposed to be a gotcha game. There is a lot of investment and intellectual property that goes into developing packaging and equipment. But that doesn't mean that consumers and regulators should be in the dark about potential problems that are generated by chemicals and other components that are released into a food, sometimes inadvertently, um, and that then consumers are exposed to those things. So creating a system where that information is present, detached perhaps from from the public view, there may not be necessarily uh, the ingredients associated with particular industries or particular uh, um, enterprises. So there is no problem with um, uh, intellectual property issues, but there should be a place where all that information is collected. And it doesn't seem to be with the regulators either, because there are ways that Indust some industries are developing packaging or processing equipment without necessarily sharing all the information with the regulators. So I think we need a combination of things. We need more trustworthiness and more transparency and ways to get information to the regulators more accurately or, or, and more often. And now you had a third factor uh, that you talked about, which was testing. And if I recall correctly, in the article, you said testing, testing, testing. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, testing is very important. Is is like uh, my example of the cake. You start with a, with a number of ingredients, but your end product is very different. It looks different. You cannot identify the initial ingredients. You have other things now. So the fact that we may know some information about the initial components of a packaging, your initial ingredients, it doesn't mean that they will remain at the end. It means that through the chemical processes that occur to generate something, other things are formed. So we need to have some level of information about the final product because the initial product, as in a cake, may not be obvious at the end. So testing can be done in many different ways. There is so much sophistication now on how to do testing, but it is important to figure out what is coming out from that material that would be in contact with food. How much of that is problematic? So testing to figure out how much comes out, what chemicals come out, how complex those chemicals are, then tested them, or testing just the mixture. Sometimes you collect information, not information, collect the, the materials, the chemicals that come out from a packaging or a food uh, equipment, like a conveyor belt, for instance, and, and then you can test that mixture and you have a better understanding of potential problems that could be created, which you can even identify which are the chemicals that comes out. Sometimes you can't, but if you, there are now so many sophisticated testing pr um, uh, procedures where you can test a whole mixture. You don't need to individually identified each chemical, you just use that mixture to figure out 
which kind of potential problems there may be. There may be none. There may be very benign outcome. But it's important that we start looking at that type of testing. And testing, keeping in mind that the people that are exposed to these potential chemicals are not like you and me, adults, or just females. There will be children. There will be exposures during pregnancy that are the exposures are fetal exposures. So we need to have a better understanding to how these potential mixtures of complex chemicals are affecting the health in, in general. Well, this has been really interesting, Maricel, and um, I thank you for spending some time with us today. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Maricel Maffini is an independent consultant and owner of MVM Consulting, where she partners with academics, nonprofit organizations, and private companies in advancing issues related to environmental health, chemical safety, and regulatory science policies. Previously, she was a senior scientist with the National Resources Defense Council and a senior officer with the Pew Charitable Trusts. Find out more about Maricel's perspective on chemicals of concern in food packaging in the December-January issue of Food Technology. Meat analogs need binding agents to hold their ingredients together. In animal meats, proteins do that job. Pascal Mall and his colleagues at the University of Hauenheim's Institute of Food Science and Biotechnology wanted to find a novel clean label binding agent. Their new study zeroes in on how stickiness is influenced by different ratios of proteins and carbohydrates in the form of pea proteins and apple pectin. Food Technologies' Emily Little recently spoke with Mall about his research and the importance of a good binding agent. Pascal, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about your research using pea proteins. Thank you for having me. So what made you decide on this specific type of research? Well, as you as you all know, vegan uh, products are definitely growing at the moment. And it's always good to have a look on uh, different alternatives. Um, soy used to be really a big one, but now not a legume is, is really starting to take off. And that is P. And that's, that is why I was very interested in this uh, specific topic. So your research deals with the so-called sticking of these analogs. What exactly does that mean? So basically for meat analogs, you need binders. And binders in that sense mean that it's an ingredient that holds everything together. So for instance, if you take um, a burger patty, you don't want the burger patty to fall apart in a pan. Or sausage, uh, you really want to have the sausage to have a firm bite and not uh, fall apart uh, too easily in the mouth. That doesn't just doesn't really uh, that that's just not uh, very appealing. And that is why you in meat analogs that um, aim to resemble uh, meat products, you want to have the same consistency and texture. And for this, you need uh, so-called binders, and binders function in a different way depending on. If you have a burger type uh, meat analog or sausage type meat analog, and that is what we were interested uh, to look in and for, well, meat analogs with core structural elements such as a bacon type meat analog or burger type meat analog, you need the binder to be sticky enough to glue everything together. So when I was reading our article about your research, I noticed you picked pea protein and apple pectin. Why those two ingredients? Well, as I said, the pea protein is really an ingredient that um, is growing in importance due to it being um, little um, allergenic. Um, also, it's widely available and it grows uh, quite well in the Northern Hemisphere. And apple pectin, on the, on the other hand, is also well known by consumers and it's also well researched, meaning that uh, we didn't have to perform a lot of well, deep uh, fundamental research on this type of ingredient. Plus, um, you can receive apple pectin um, in different chain lengths and different degrees of esterification. And that's 
just makes uh, things much easier. So let's get to the nitty gritty of what you did. Can you describe the experiments you ran and how exactly you tested these binding agents? So first of all, we wanted to test um, mixes of pea protein and an apopectin for their stickiness. And for this, we uh, basically varied uh, pH value, the ratio of pea proteins to pectin, and also the concentrations of the biopolymers. And there we found that uh, you have to pick a certain pH and a certain ratio of pea proteins and pectins in order to end up with a viscoelastic system. And this viscoelasticity then governs stickiness. So that was um, the first step, basically, to have... Um, a sticky component that is able to bind different structural elements, as I said before, together. And the second step was then to solidify such, um, such a component, because that is also what happens in um, meat systems. If you took, again, for instance, the burger patty, there you have proteinaceous components that are sticky, and in the pan, they harden and solidify, thereby setting the structure. And that is exactly what we wanted to achieve with our mixes, that we have a sticky um, component at first, and then we would be able to transition this component into a solid structure. And what were your findings? Basically, there, there are uh, several methods um, that can be used in order to solidify such um, a structure. It really depends on the protein that you use or the pectin that you use. And what we have found that we could um, solidify a pea protein apple pectin mixture by um, inducing cross linkings due to cations such as um, calcium. However, this approach isn't really, cannot really be orchestrated very well from a time perspective. And that is why enzymes uh, work much better there. And uh, that is also what we have found then that, that if we use certain enzymes, we could um, really um, trigger this solidification step as uh, at the time point we wanted to. And were there different combinations that worked better for different analogs? I know you mentioned sausage analogs and, bur and burger analogs are slightly different. Uh, we only concentrated on burger analogs and okay. bacon analogs. And there we have found that for bacon analogs, uh, we have to uh, decrease the biopolymer concentration because if we uh, took a too high biopolymer concentration, we couldn't really apply the binder on the structural elements itself because it would just rip apart the, um, the structural elements because of being too high in stickiness. And that is why we have uh, chosen a lower biopolymer concentration there. But for burger um, type analogs where we had mostly textured vegetable proteins, um, it worked uh, better to use a higher concentration of biopolymers in the binder itself. So where does your research go from here? We have filed a patent um, for, for this. And then it really depends on the industry partner what uh, they will be doing with that patent. And how do you think that consumers are going to react to these biopolymers? Because that's, you got to get through to them, right? Well, I, I feel like uh, pea proteins are already quite well established uh, in the shelves of the supermarkets. And so is pectin. You have to know pectin is used in champs for quite a while already. So I feel like this uh, combination of uh, biopolymers um, is not really very new to, to old people. Well, Pascal, thank you so much for talking to me, and I look forward to reading more of your research. Thank you very much, and thank you for your time. Pascal Mall is a recent doctoral student at the University of Hauenheim's Institute of Food Science and Biotechnology in Stuttgart, Germany. You can read more about his recent study in the latest issue of Food Technology Magazine. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, IFT's 2022 Compensation and Career Path Report. Get the latest information to help you negotiate your next raise or retain your most talented employees. Download a copy at ift.org slash salary survey.
And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org slash membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation in the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of ift.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at ift.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.